This might be one of those mornings where you listen to those readings and you go, how in the world does anybody think that these all go together? How do we get the Ten Commandments? And I would love to have a discussion with any of you that want to have it as why we have Ten Commandments. Um, I had a discussion with some friends yesterday on Facebook. I think when I did a lesson for the confirmation kids that I came up with like 23 commandments out of that scripture lesson there. So why do we have 10? One of my friends yesterday said there should be nine. There should be three that point us to God, three that point us to self, and three that point us to neighbor. Right? Three is a special number in the Bible, so we have three. Three for God, three for me, three for everyone else. Makes perfect sense. But we have 10. And if we do these Ten Commandments, everything in our life will be peachy and perfect, right? No. It's actually impossible to keep the Ten Commandments. If you take Luther's explanations in the small catechism, if anybody needs one, come see me. I'll make sure that you get one. Um, a small, if you look at that, or if you look at Jesus' explanation when he expounds upon them. You know, thou shalt not commit murder. It's not just the same to not kill something. It's the fact that if Jesus said, if you think bad thoughts about someone else, you're murdering them in your mind. So it's, it's impossible. And how do we get this stumbling block thing going along with Jesus overturning the tables? How many of you were here early enough that you saw the, the script table overturned this morning? I overturned the script table this morning. Now you know why, right? And we all know that story too, right? It's very familiar to us. Yes, we've heard it many, many times. It's actually one of the stories that's in all four Gospels. And it's exactly the same in all four Gospels, right? Thank you, Amy. No, it's not. It's actually the same in three of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then we get John. Good old John, who does things different a little bit. Most of the time. The interesting part to this story is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's much more towards the end of the gospel. And where is it in John? What chapter is it in? Two. Right. It's like towards the beginning of the book. It's one of the very first things that Jesus does in his ministry. And why is that? Why is John so much different? And it's different in, even in the aspects that it looks at. Because Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he goes into the temple and he overturns the tables because the people in there are doing what to the people that are using them? See, here's the history we have to understand first a little bit about this. Is This is a necessary thing that has to happen. There has to be money changers in the temple. Because the temple used its own money. It's kind of like going to Canada. Eh? Right? If you go to Canada, well, they'll take your money. Okay, let's use a different country. Um, Germany. If you go to Germany, you need to have euros, right? Now, they probably will still take your American currency some places, but to actually make it work correctly, you need to go someplace and exchange your currency for their currency. That's the way it worked in the temple. The temple did not use Roman money. And most of these people had Roman money because it was a Roman-occupied state. So in order for them to do anything in the temple, they had to exchange their money. And then most of them traveled long distances to come to the temple because the temple was the center of worship. The temple was the place that people came to do their worshiping of God. It was a place they came to see God. It was a place they came to get something from God. That's the reason you all came here this morning, right? You came here to get something. It would be interesting for me to ask you what you came to get or what you think you're going to get when you come here. But people had to travel long distances to get to the place that they were going to worship. And when they got there, then they had to offer sacrifices in the Jewish system. So you had to have animals with you to offer sacrifice. So if you traveled a long distance and you have a bunch of your family in tow with you, do you also want to bring along your dud, two pigeons or your turtle doves or your cattle or your sheep? And take care of it along the way because it has to be perfect. There can't be anything wrong with it when you go to sacrifice it. It has to still be perfect without blemish. So do you want to carry that along with you? Or do you want to be able to get that when you get that? That's one less thing I have to worry about. I don't have to pack the sheep. I know I can buy one when I get there. Right? That's why they were there. That's why these people were in the temple. 
And Jesus goes and he overturns the, temp- the tables in the temple and the money changers because they're robbing from the, the poor, right? That's what John said this morning. Right? Is that what John said? I see a couple people looking. No, that's what Matthew, Mark, and Luke say. That Jesus overturned the table and he said, Stop making my father's house a den of robbers. It's not what John is talking about, though. See, we get these stories mixed up. John is the one where he takes the cords, which is probably the hay from some of the cattle stalls or where the sheep are laying down, and he winds them together. And he drove all of them out of the temple. Who is all of them? He probably actually didn't whip any people. If you read it closely, it looks like he whipped the cattle and the sheep and drove them out. He didn't actually whip the people. I don't know, though. It doesn't really say, so... That brings up a good joke. What, is, what, what should you do when people ask you, what would Jesus do? Look them right in the eye and go, well, I guess making a whip and turning tables over and driving people out of this place isn't out of the question now, is it? It's what he did. But in John, Jesus doesn't overturn the tables and say, you're making my house, father's house into a den of robbers. He says, get these things out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. Um, excuse me, Jesus, but I need to be able to buy those things because I need to be able to do the worship that I'm supposed to be able to do here. So how am I supposed to worship here then? That's really what John's gospel is about. It's not about where we go to get fed by God. It's not about going to the proper place to do worship. How many of you have ever read the, the wonderful series or seen the movies now? I see a Lewis. Do you know which one I'm saying? A couple of you know which one I'm talking about. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is the first book. First book. It's not the first book. It's the first book. Right? In the story in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the four children, Peter, Susan, Lucy, and Edmund, go through the wardrobe into another land of Narnia, and they meet Aslan. And Aslan is a lion. Right? He's also very much a Christ figure. If you don't know, C.S. Lewis was a profound Christian. And the Narnia series is talking about who we are in the world and how we live in the world. And the four children had to go into Narnia to learn what it was like to be with Aslam and to learn who he was and how we needed to live in our daily lives. In the second movie, Prince Caspian, all four children go back, but at the end of that movie, Peter and Susan are told by Aslan that they will not ever be able to return to Narnia. They have to live in their own world. To which Lucy gets a little upset. But she's told that she gets to return. At the end of the third book, however, Lucy and Edmund are told the exact same thing by Aslan, that they will never again be allowed to return to Narnia. And Lucy is so distraught because she's worried about the fact that she'll never get to see Aslan again. And Aslan tells her... You will see me in your world. And she, wait, how am I going to see you in, in my world? And he kind of explains to her that you've been coming here to Narnia to learn who I am and to be able to witness me and to see me and the things around you, to know who I am in the world around you. Right? Isn't that the image of really what we're doing here this morning? We come to this place hoping that we're going to see God, that we're going to have some kind of interaction with God. And God wants us to come to this place, to gather and to worship, to be fed by by the sacraments, to hear His Word. But He doesn't call us to stay here. And He doesn't call us here just to only spend time with Him here. See, God is not just here. We have this this notion of going on mission trips where we are going to go and take God to see the people. Right? Those of you that have ever been on a mission trip, how many times have you encountered God more where you went than you thought you were going to? Normally, you don't take God anywhere. You go there and you meet God, and the people there surprise the heck out of you because God has already been there and working. God is out there in the world. He's not sitting in this room waiting for us to come and to be with Him. He's already out there, waiting for us to encounter Him where we're at, waiting for us to join Him in what He's already doing out there in the world. 
That's why over the two doors that go out of this building, the main two doors that go out of this building, what does the sign say? Servant's entrance. Because we're called here to see who God is, to learn who He is, so that we can recognize Him, so that when we go outside of these doors, we see Him. And we know that's who He is. And we can join Him in what He's already doing. It's kind of the difference between centripetal and centripetal force. Here's your science lesson, kids. You can tell your science teachers tomorrow morning you have a science lesson at church. Centripetal force is a force that draws things towards the center, right? Right? I, I'm, I'm a little confused, so I'm, that's the actual question. Yeah. Centripetal force is things that draws into the center. And that's normally the way we think of church, that church draws us in, that we have to come into this place, and we're drawn in here, and as we come in, we're drawn closer and closer to God. Centripetal force is that force when you get on one of those rides that you stand up against the outside of the thing and then it spins around real fast and then the floor drops out and then it starts to spin, right? Yeah, my stomach's getting a little queasy even thinking about it. But you don't move, right? Because the ride is spinning so fast and you're being pushed out and held against the back. You're being pushed out. And that's the force that God is to us. It's not centripetal. He's not drawing us into Him. He's helping us to see who He is and then pushing us out. He's pushing us out into the world so that we can go out there and join Him in what He's already doing. He's pushing us out into the world because that's what John's Gospel is trying to tell us. We're not supposed to gather in this one place to worship God. We're supposed to worship God with our lives and through that be in the world to show them exactly who God is. Now, you all should have gotten the little blue cards, and the ushers told you if you got a purple one, you, you win. They're all blue, though, so nobody wins. Ah, there you go. The point of the blue card, though, is if you feel so moved to, I want you to think about, while we're singing the hymn, while we're going, working through a little bit of worship here, before we get to the offering, and I want you to write on this blue piece of paper where it is that you're going to be this week. Because you know what? I can guarantee you that God's already going to be there. Where is it that you're going to go this week to meet God? Because it's not here. I'm not saying you don't meet God when you come here. You do meet God when you come here. But you meet God when you go to Walmart or to Abrams Elementary or to Pulaski Middle School or Deerfield Diner or... Lambo Field, or... Wow, did I really say that? Wow. <laughs> right? Where is God going to meet you? Because we do a really good job of lifting up our Sunday school teachers. We do a really good job of lifting up our council. We've, we've installed our Sunday school teachers. We've installed our council. But some of the stuff I read this week talking about vocation, which is some, one of my... I love talking about Luther's understanding of vocation and how we're all called and how God goes with us everywhere that we go. But I've never done some of the things I've read about this week. Um, in a passage from a book and some of the study that I talked about how we lift up all these people. We lift up the youth. Like when we go to Detroit this summer, we'll bring the youth up that are going to Detroit. We, when we get ready to go to camp, we'll bring the kids up that are going to camp to hold them up. But how many of you are um, CPAs or work in financial stuff? Nobody. One. This is like a big time for CPAs, right? It's tax season. Not for you, really. But, but for CPAs that do tax work, now is the big time. And we should raise those people up and be praying for them. And think about other vocations that we don't even talk about. God goes with you everywhere that you go. God has called you and gifted you and given you something to do in the world Martin Luther said, if you're a cobbler and you make shoes and you're a Christian cobbler and you make shoes, you don't make Christian shoes by putting little crosses on them. You make Christian shoes by making the best darn shoes that you can make because that's the gift that God gave you. That's the centripetal force of God pushing us out into the world, knowing that we can see who He is and know who He is and that He's an integral part of our lives. And then He pushes us out back out into the world so that everyone else out there can see because you are salt and you are light and you are a beacon of hope to bring everyone else who's in darkness to the, to the knowledge and the fact that God loves them just as much as He loves you. 
So don't make a whip and whip people to give them to you. Just be who you are in Christ and show them how much God loves you. And that alone is going to be something that's going to make them ask you about where it is that you got what it is that you got. And that is what will bring them searching and looking to gather with the gathered body, to be fed, to be sent back out. Because that's what it's about. It's not about us gathering here. It's about us going through those doors and being Christ in the world. So go, but not yet. And be Christ in the world, wherever your daily lives will take you.